traumatic brain injury has been really on the research end. So the way this is going to work tonight is I'm going to tell you not necessarily about my research, sorry. Um, <laughs> you can, we can talk about that another night. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the underlying neuroscience of traumatic brain injury and what literally happens to your brain and why that in and of itself is bad. And then I will turn it over um, to Jeff, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the clinical aspects of traumatic brain injury. So I treat rats, and Jeff treats people. So, but I'll give you my underlying perspective. Um, so what I do want to emphasize is I agree with Peggy that I'm, none of us really are out here to tell you not to play sports. Sports are really integral to your health, to your well-being, and they're really important for the social development of children as well. But what we have to understand is that there are some sports that may be a better choice than others, and you really have to be well-educated regardless of the sport that you choose your child to become involved with. So, um, why did, oops, why did I, so I've been behind the lab bench for years. I've been a researcher working in a lab, and why have I decided to all of a sudden come out and start speaking with the public? And part of it was I um, saw a video very similar to this by a group of uh, individuals in the Sports Legacy Institute, led by Chris Nowinski, and, and Jeff's affiliated with this group as well. And when I saw this video, I was just like, I was appalled at the fact that this is still happening, and the fact that traumatic brain injury is occurring when it really shouldn't be. My focus has been on trying to come up with ways in which our brain can reorganize after brain injury. How can we fix brain injury? And I've never really thought about the fact that individuals are out there subjecting themselves to traumatic brain injury when they really shouldn't, especially individuals who are, are, are quite young. And so this is a disturbing video. Not everyone may be excited about it. I know Jeff's going to show it in a different context. But this is, the reason I want to start with this is this is what got me involved in, in doing something like this, speaking to the general public uh, about concussions. Um, what DePaul also does is that we have a group of undergraduate uh, uh, students who actually go out and give concussion education presentations to youth. Um, they go out, they speak to youth about what is a concussion, what are the symptoms, how can you play sports safely? Um, because some of the issues are really that if you get a concussion, you can recover from it. But what happens in youth sports is that kids don't necessarily know that they've had a concussion, and they don't know what the signs are, and they don't know to say that it's okay not to play today because I don't quite feel like it. And so SLICE, SLICE, is a group that I um, work with at DePaul. And so if any of you are interested in, in having concussion education to your youth programs or public schools, let me know. But like I said, the reason I'm, I'm doing this commercial for the moment is because I saw a video similar to this, and it really made me realize that I, I have to do more and I have to get out of the bench and actually get out and, and work with uh, the public and, and speak to you all about concussions. So here's the video. Still stopping. Go, go. Oh, oh my go. gosh. <laughs> and so obviously, that, uh, we don't need to find that, watch that more than once. Um, so that obviously, that child most likely got a concussion. Um, so my job is to tell you a little bit about what traumatic brain injury is. And so the official definition is it's damage to your brain due to some sort of a physical blow to the head. And these physical blow to the heads happen from a variety of things, motor vehicle accidents, falls, violence. And this definition is being challenged recently by the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in which individuals are receiving traumatic brain injury due to blast, meaning they have a physical force that is actually producing changes in their brain that, redu that produces traumatic brain injury. That's not the type of brain injury we'll be speaking of today, but I just wanted you to be aware that even the definition of traumatic brain injury is actually being challenged currently with these, with these wars. Um, there are no treatments. There's no magic bullet out there. You cannot take a drug, you cannot take a pill after you've had a traumatic brain injury and feel better, prevent your cells from dying, et cetera. So great strides have been made in, with regards to TBI management. So what do you do when someone with a traumatic brain injury comes into an emergency room, a clinic, et cetera, what do you do with them? There has been great strides in that. And really what patients rely on is traumatic brain injury rehabilitation, um, cognitive rehabilitation, physical rehabilitation, et cetera. And that really is the underlying uh, treatment right now. Um, that is something that our lab focuses on. We look at rehabilitation, we look at neuroplasticity, the idea that your brain can change and reorganize. 
And interestingly, what we're finding is that following traumatic brain injury, your, your brain isn't as plastic as you would think it should be. Um, it's, it's much less pr plastic than it is following, uh, than a brain following stroke, for example. And this basically translates into, in our, in our research, that um, the type of rehabilitation individuals need following a TBI is very different. It, you need to, it needs to be more intense, it needs to be more varied, et cetera. So that's a little snippet, Peggy, into the kind of research that I'm doing, but that's really not the focus of today. But what I did want to say is that rehabilitation is really the only treatment out there. And um, it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, this is just a little plug to show you that currently traumatic brain injury by the World Health Organization, the CDC, it's a big issue, it's a big problem. And unfortunately, funding for traumatic brain injury is, is quite low compared to other diseases. And um, this is just a, a graph from the National Institute of Health. And really the funding rates are um, um, along the same lines as something like Crohn's disease, which is much uh, not as, as prevalent as something like traumatic brain injury. But I, what I wanted to bring your attention to is this breast cancer. Um, that receives a huge amount of funding, and yet the incidence rate is lower than traumatic brain injury. I'm not someone who's saying we shouldn't fund breast cancer. What I'm trying to say with this is that because funding rates for breast cancer are so high and have increased so much, the, um, the treatments available for breast cancer now are much better than they were 10 years ago. And individuals who are, are diagnosed with breast cancer live for much longer than they used to and are being cured. Um, so this is my, my two minute plug for more funding for traumatic brain injury research. I have to do that, I'm a researcher. Okay? So that being said, what happens? What happens following traumatic brain injury? So what I like to think of our brain is, as, as, a, as jello. And we have this jello that's inside of our heads encased in a skull. So I like to think of it as you have an egg, you have the nice you know, egg yolk and egg white inside the egg and your um, eggshell is your cranium, okay? You take that eggshell and you shake it, okay? That is what happens following a traumatic brain injury. You hit your head, the head goes back and forth and what you see is depending on where you get hit, your brain sloshes from sides to side and areas receive mechanical injury, okay? Why is this bad? Well, you have to a little uh, understand how neuron, how the brain functions. The brain functions based on cells in our brain called neurons. And these neurons, as you see here, basically they communicate information. So a signal arrives at a neuron, it gets sent down the axon to another neuron, and then that neuron takes that information via a neurotransmitter, a chemical signal, and then sends it along, okay? And basically this electrical to chemical to electrical conduction is how information goes from part A to part B in our brain to create the behaviors that we do on a daily basis, okay? This is what a real one looks like, okay? <laughs> um, they're not as cartoony, but that's what a real one looks like. So what happens following traumatic brain, and oh, so what happens is that these neurons then form circuits form systems, and there's different systems depending on the behavior. And so for example, if you're a neuron that lives here, you might send some information out this way, and that may help you move, for example, okay? And so these neurons form these systems. And when you are receiving a traumatic brain injury, what happens is that these axons, one of the things that, they, that happens is these axons move in shear and stretch. So you can imagine a rubber band take that rubber band and pull it, and if you pull it too far, it'll break, right? And the rubber band can no longer serve its purpose. That's one of the things that can happen in uh, traumatic brain injury. Specifically, that is a big thing that happens following concussion. And so what happens is that these connections that used to be there are no longer there. And you've got brain areas that are involved in thought, in cognition, in memory, that no longer have the connections made that need to be made. The other thing that happens following brain injury is there's this whole metabolic cascade. The brain is an organ just like any other organ. It needs energy, it needs oxygen, it needs glucose. And following an injury, basically what happens is the chemicals inside our neurons become imbalanced. And that imbalance ends up producing a huge influx of calcium. We all like calcium, calcium's good, but too much calcium in the brain is not good. Too much calcium in our brains produce a um, toxic effect. And it makes the neurons want to use lots and lots of energy following traumatic brain injury. 
At this time, however, the traumatically injured brain has a lack of flow of blood to the brain. Okay? And this lack of flow of blood to the brain is basically a supply and demand. Okay? There's all this demand, the metabolism, but there's not enough of a supply. Okay? You're not getting the blood flow to the brain the way it's supposed to be. Okay? So what this ends up with is something called a metabolic crisis. How long is it? We have no idea in humans, per se. One of the key things that some individuals are trying to do is they're trying to see whether or not we can use the length of a metabolic crisis to potentially predict when someone could go back to play, and, and perhaps Jeff will speak to this, um, or perhaps use this metabolic dysfunction to get a, a better understanding of which brain areas are affected, but we're still a little far away from that. But, but on a science level, this is what's happening. And this metabolic crisis, luckily, um, can go away after a couple of days, after several days. In a rat, it takes two weeks. How does that translate into a human? Uh, there's no, you know, there's no uh, mathematical computation that I can do to convert two weeks in a rat to X number of years in a human. Rats live about one and a half years. You can kind of maybe do some math. Um, but basically, the thing about concussions is that this metabolic crisis, this neurological insult over time can dissipate and can return to normal. What we don't know is how long for sure that takes. And what we don't know and what we do know is that from person to person that's going to vary significantly, which is why it's challenging to study traumatic brain injury. Okay. Um, so then when you've got this metabolic function in these circuits, what's happening is that connections that used to be there are no longer functional. Uh, a lot of this metabolic dysfunction, a lot of this disconnection happens in brain areas that are responsible for things like memory, attention, um, uh, and other cognitive functioning. Emotions, okay? And so like I said, after a single concussion, a lot of these things can go away. It can dissipate. People recover very well from a single concussion. What we're all hearing about more so now in the media are athletes who don't just get a single concussion. And this is also something that happens in the military. These individuals are uh, exposed to repeated concussions. And what happens is that if a second concussion happens before the brain's had an opportunity to heal, you're basically injuring an injured brain. And we all know we don't need science to tell you that that's probably not good. Okay. And so what you're doing is you're injuring already vulnerable neurons, and there's numerous evidence now that this can lead to more longer-term deficits. Um, there's been a recent study that, that within a cohort, a small cohort of NFL players, that these repeat multiple concussions uh, seem to have a strong link or correlation to an increase in the propensity or risk for neurodegenerative diseases, things like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And so I think the interest in, in concussions has come from this concept of, re, of repeat concussions. And unfortunately, uh, so, so this is an example of a brain, a normal quote unquote brain, and this is a, if I took your brain and I sliced it like this, okay, and I just looked at half of it, and then I stained it with this pretty purple stain, what you see here are the cell bodies, okay, of individual neurons. And that's what a quote-unquote normal, as normal as any of us are, brain looks like, okay? Um, uh, Anne McKee's group in Boston and a variety of others are demonstrating that if you take brains of individuals who have received multiple concussion, concussions, okay, you, what you see is you see an increase in this darkly brown stained area. And this darkly st uh, stained brown area, what this is, is a protein called phosphorylated tau. This is a protein that normally is in our brains that helps those neurons have their shape and their function and send information back and forth, so it's normally there. But after traumatic brain injury, and we don't know specifically why, it seems to be that this tau protein gets phosphorylated. It gets a change that causes it, the protein to become more sticky. Stick to each other. Basically, if you can imagine proteins that are supposed to help the neuron keep, its, keep itself stable, keep its shape, and now it's sticky, it's going to mess up signaling. Okay. And what's interesting is that this tau protein um, seems to be the link to this disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And it's, the tau protein aggregates in areas of the brain that are responsible for some of the, the 
symptomatology that Jeff's going to talk about with regards to cognition, with regards to emotion, attention, risk taking, things of that nature. Okay. So the other thing that got me realizing that I've got to do more than sit behind my bench is the fact that in this publication there was tau protein present in an individual who committed suicide who was 17 years old and it was a former athlete. So this isn't just something that occurs following years of, of, of time in, in the NFL. It can be something that potentially, not, not, not all, but it can be something that shows up in a 17 year old who really shouldn't have this protein in their brains. Um, so that's some, one of the reasons that I was motivated to talk more about this. Okay. So, um, you know, you've heard of, of the athletes and you've a number of athletes have worked with Sports Legacy Institute to donate their brains to science to demonstrate this, this pathology. And that's all great, but we really, it's correlative. We don't really know exactly why traumatic brain injury results, or if it truly is the main factor, although many uh, fingers point to it, uh, of the main factor to this traumatic, uh, to this tau protein. Um, we don't actually know the mechanism under which mu multiple concussions produce this link to neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and so more research is needed, and that is something that our lab is doing. We've developed a model of repeat concussions in the rat, and our are using that model to try and better understand the mechanisms under which some of these things are occurring. Um, so that's the science behind traumatic brain injury. And I will leave it to Jeff to tell you more about what happens in actual humans. Okay. So, um, sorry. <laughs> Our next speaker will be Jeff Mianis, who is uh, at Rush uh, University Medical Center, and he directs the Chicago Sports Concussion Clinic there. So I'm really eager to hear his uh, experiences treating uh, uh, athletes at multiple levels in multiple sports. Thank you. If you haven't heard me yet, I would hold, I would hold off on the applause. You haven't heard anything yet. All right, thank you very much. Um, I do like to hide behind the podium, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just cower back here for a little bit. Um, so my name is Jeff Mianis. I actually was a pediatrician by training and then went on to sports medicine. Now I see adults and children in my clinic. I'm at Rush University uh, downtown. Um, I work with US soccer, uh, USA, USA rugby. I'm one of the team physicians for both of them. I'm also the head team physician for the Chicago Fire uh, soccer team here in Chicago and DePaul University, so, which is how our paths have crossed. Um, so I see athletes of all ages and I do direct our sports concussion clinic. So I have the task of trying to explain concussion in about 15 minutes. Um, so I guess everybody should buckle up. Um, the definition that most of us use of concussion comes from the Fourth International Conference on Concussion in Sport in Zurich, Switzerland, and they, devi they define concussion as a traumatic injury to the brain, and I do think this is important because I think a lot of people forget, um, and the whole reason that we're here is that this is an actual brain injury. A concussion is an injury to the brain tissue itself. And I think a lot of kids, even today, are still getting caught up in that it's a ding, it's just, I just got my bell rung. This is the most important organ in your body. It controls everything. It's very fragile, which is why Mother Nature, God, whomever you believe in, encased it in a, in a vault of bone. Uh, and so that's why this organ is so important. Um, and the truth is that an injury to this structure can, can be very devastating for a person. Um, a, a concussion results in impaired brain function. So that's another important point here is that it's more of an injury to the way the brain functions than actually to the structure of the brain itself. Um, and it results in a set of symptoms, which we'll go through in a minute. Typically, those symptoms start right away, usually within the first day or so. Um, the symptoms can involve loss of consciousness, but don't have to, and, off, and most often do not. 
actually involve loss of consciousness. Um, the symptoms do resolve spontaneously and usually sequentially, meaning they do gradually get better. The cause of a concussion um, is, uh, and Dorothy alluded to this, is basically a force, a traumatic injury to the head. Um, now, it doesn't actually have to happen to the head itself. It could happen to the body, which is actually the way that most of the injuries that we're seeing now in the military come are from an, a blast, like a blast wave that basically impacts the, the body and shakes the head. But I like to tell people uh, in my clinic, uh, I think one thing, you can have a whiplash injury without a concussion, but you cannot really have a concussion without a whiplash injury. To shake the brain, you need to shake the head. And so that happens either from a direct blow to the head or a blow to the body where the head shakes, um, but that is really how you get that brain to shake. Um, there's two types of forces that could cause that shaking. One is called a linear force. It's an acceleration, deceleration, straight on force. So imagine somebody getting hit here, falling off your bike, you're going really fast, um, you fall off your bike, you land, you directly hit. There's no time for you to rotate your head. So that's a linear force. There's also a type of force called a rotational force. And this is an angular velocity, an angular acceleration, and it can shake the head uh, from side to side. And one way to um, think about this is to go back to the analogy Dorothy used, which is basically that your brain is like jello. So imagine I made a bowl of jello, okay? And I have this glass bowl and I have jello there. And I can take that bowl and I can shake it this way. And that would be that linear force. And if I shake it enough, what will happen to that jello? It'll get little wrinkles in it, it'll get little cracks in it. That's actually what happens in the linear force. The rotational would be I took the bowl and I rotated it this way, side to side. So I'm rotating it side to side. The same thing's gonna happen, right? That brain, I'm sorry, that jello, gelatinous structure will get disrupted. Well, most concussions we actually think happen from a combination of both forces. It's a combination of rotational plus linear. So in linear terms, we talk of, usually through, people throw around a number of like 100 or 80 Gs of force. That's quite a lot of force actually uh, to cause a uh, concussion. Why do most concussions probably happen at far lesser forces than that? Because there's a combination of rotational plus the linear happening. So you have that rotational force. Think of somebody who's coming in, they're, they're, think of a wide receiver and they're trying to catch that football and they're turning their head to, to do so and then they get hit. So now they've got the brains in rotation and now they get a direct linear hit. That combination of rotational plus linear can lower the threshold of force needed to cause injury to the brain. So again, most of these, most concussions probably happen from a combination of these. One last point on that. Helmets are great for sports like football and hockey at dissipating the linear force. And that's why they work so well to prevent skull fractures and brain bleeds. But as of yet, we have not found a helmet that diminishes that rotational force, which is why we still have concussions in football and hockey. Um, I'm not going to go through the blue part here, the mechanical, I mean this is actually what Dorothy just went through. So again, the, the point here was to link that, that trauma, those forces on the skull will lead to this, con this cascade of events, which is really what a concussion is. And, and what it, uh, Dorothy was saying is true, a concussion is not really an event, it's more of a process. The event is the trauma, the concussion is this cascade of events, this process that the brain has to go through and then uh, and on its road to recovery so so uh, she put this video in too and she didn't play it again because she didn't want you guys to suffer but I kind of want you to suffer a little bit so um, I don't know how to play it though how do I oh just hit here still stopping so these guys are about seven eight and if that wasn't bad enough, you get it in slow mo. Even the coach says, gosh. Um, how do I go on? I don't know how it. How do I get to the next slide from this one? because the computer's freezing. Right I just now. shook it to show it what it feels like. 
Sorry, everybody. <laughs> now, has anybody seen Friday Night Tykes? Okay, that's the other clip I like to show on here, which is from the Esquire Network, which is, if you ever want to feel that you had some faith in the human race, watch, um, watch that show, and then you will lose all faith in humanity. Where you Thank you. Thanks. Um, so how common is concussion? Well, uh, it's estimated that up to 4 million concussions occur every year in the United States. Um, and up to a million of these are in high school athletes alone. Um, it's estimated that up to 85%, and the numbers are different. There was a newer study coming out that just showed about 40%. But a, a large chunk of concussions probably go unreported. And people have looked at why. And actually, the number one reason um, when they asked high school students why uh, they didn't report their concussion symptoms, it's because they thought that the injury was not severe, they didn't want to be removed from play, and they didn't know what a concussion was. And so if you think about even these top three reasons, at least two of them we could hopefully try to diminish through education, right? Um, some of them don't want to leave their let their teammates down, let their coach down as well. These are all issues that we need to think about when we have children and they're not reporting why they have concussion symptoms. The incidence in high school, the injury rate per 1,000 exposures. And so what I mean by an exposure is a time to go out where there's a potential for contact. And why I wrote exposure is because that means it could be at a practice or it could be at a game, any time that there's a potential for you to get hit in the head, right? That's why we call them exposures. So that's how we break a rate down is actually the amount, the frequency that it happens per exposure. So this is one study actually um, in the American Journal of Sports Medicine from 2011. Far and away the sport with the highest rate of concussion was actually football, uh, followed by girls soccer, lacrosse was in the middle, um, boys soccer and boys wrestling, then girls basketball. In college, uh, a couple points on this, and this is also from 2011, women's ice hockey, extremely high with a rate of 0 0.91 uh, for 1,000 athletic exposures. Men's ice hockey was down at 0 0.41. Spring football, a lot worse actually than fall football. Uh, spring football, 0.54, and fall football was 0.37. Then you have women's soccer and then other sports, as you can see on there. Overall, um, when we compare sports, far and away, the two sports that probably take the cake are football and ice hockey in terms of concussions. Um, and what's interesting about these sports is they wear a helmet and they wear pads. Um, lacrosse is kind of tied in the middle there. Um, and this is, this is one source, again, uh, part of the problem here when we look at these different studies on epidemiology are that some sports are considered in some data sets and some sports aren't. I'll give you a good example. Hockey is often not an organized team sport at many, at almost any high school here uh, in Chicago, for example, right? Or in colleges. I mean, most colleges don't have an official hockey team. They might have club hockey, and the same goes for rugby. Uh, rugby is not a sanctioned sport here. It's usually a club sport. So uh, there are some schools where if they had just asked athletic trainers at colleges, you're going to lose a chunk of data because not all those sports are actually, not all those injuries see an athletic trainer. If it's a club sport, you often don't have an athletic trainer taking care of the athlete. So that's why, uh, just as a little case in point, why it's somewhat difficult sometimes to compare these study to study to study and get an exact easy number. Well, which sport is the highest risk? It's hard because the studies show different things. But if you pair, put them all together, usually football and ice hockey are definitely the worst sports. So how does a concussion present? Well, I think two things. If you got hit on the head, 
and you have any of these symptoms, you have a concussion. We'll just make it that simple. So first thing is you have to find out what the mechanism of injury was, right? And then the symptoms. They can have things like headache or pressure in the head, feeling of neck pain, nausea, sometimes vomiting, dizziness, vision problems, balance problems are extremely common. Usually they have sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise. Uh, sometimes they're feeling slowed down or feeling in a fog, perhaps like many of you are right now. Um, they don't feel quite right. It, don't worry, that'll end. I'll stop talking soon. Um, they have, might have difficulty concentrating, difficulty remembering, uh, low energy and fatigue, confusion. Often sleep troubles are very, very common. So um, both feeling fatigued, feeling drowsy, feeling somnolent, but also having trouble falling asleep. So their quality of sleep is very poor. Um, and they can have emotional changes. They can be irritable, sad, nervous, frustrated, anxious. Um, but the diagnosis is tricky because we don't have a magic wand. There's no test that I can do. There's no scan. There's no, I'm, I'm waiting for the iPhone app. There's no app that tells me if you've had a concussion or not. Um, so really what we have to base everything off of are the symptoms. So if an athlete gets hit to the head or hit in the body and their head shakes and they have these symptoms, then I think it's probably a concussion, as I was saying. Um, now, I've had plenty of, I think I've pretty much seen it all. Like I've had people who have told me they were reading their iPad in bed and they fell asleep and they fell and it hit them on their forehead and they've had headaches for three months and they're worried about their concussion and I'm just sorry that's not enough, no matter how much your iPad weighs, no matter how many, how, what, what cover you bought from it at the uh, Apple store, it's not going to weigh enough to cause that amount of force. Um, but I've also had people, I just saw a kid the other day who came in and was fine for three days after a hit in soccer and then started having a headache. Is that a concussion? I don't know. Not by the definition I used before, right? Their, their symptoms started more than 24 hours later. They can be very tricky. There's no, a lot of this is based off of um, our clinical gut feeling uh, when we see you. In Zurich, they address this saying, the clinical, it's a clinical diagnosis, and this is based on recognition, recognition of the type of injury, so a head injury or a neck injury with a whiplash type injury to the brain, symptoms, and then they have usually some type of cognitive dysfunction or possibly cranial nerve dysfunction, the nerves that control our, our face and, and upper and our head and neck, and some balance disturbance. And if they have these things, you should pretty much assume that it's a concussion. And they can happen in any sport. Um, on the sidelines, what do we do? We, we examine you. So if I'm covering a football game or a soccer game and somebody goes up and they get an injury to the head, you know, we take a look at you, we look at their orientation, we ask them questions. The medics questions are a type of question where, uh, where are we playing today? Who was, who's your opponent? What's the, what's the score? Who did you play last week? What was the score? Um, we look at your cranial nerves, so which are the nerves that I just talked about, which control things like your eye motions and things like that. We examine your neck uh, to make sure. Often, a very high correlation with neck injuries, as, as, we, as I just mentioned, with a whiplash type thing. And then cerebellar, F to N means finger to nose. We usually just do a brief test of cerebellar function, which is the part of the brain that controls motion. And then we usually look at your balance. Um, we can also do a more detailed kind of cognitive evaluation, um, giving some questions, give you five words, ask you to remember them and repeat them back to me, things like that. Um, interestingly enough, we used to give a test called serial sevens. Uh, anybody know what that is? Any med students here? Yeah, so it's, uh, we used to take 100 and then you'd subtract seven. So 93, then you keep subtracting seven, right? We did this until there was a study about 12 years ago that medical students couldn't do serial sevens. <laughs> then we stopped using that test because it started to make us look bad. Um, so we don't usually do serial sevens anymore. And then we have some tools called the SCAT-2, SCAT-3, and the King Divic test, for example. I just threw this up there. This is the SCAT-3. SCAT means Sports Concussion Assessment Tool. Three means it's the third version. And what it has on here, on the first page, I just skipped over it, but it um, basically has demographic information, thematics questions. Here's a whole symptom list that you can see right here. Um, so on the side, pretty much every symptom that I went through, the 22 symptoms we kind of consider classic for a concussion. You don't have to have all of them, by the way, to be diagnosed with a concussion. 
Um, and then on the right, you see the cognitive assessment, which is kind of the examples that I just used as to how we would normally assess them, giving them five words, for example, things like that. Now, you th may think that your teenager cannot remember to pick up their room or to remember to call you before they come home after their curfew, but what's funny is they can remember these words uh, like a week later. They'll remember the same words. So you'll see a list of words up there and they'll be like apple, elbow, bubble, yeah. They know them, they can remember them from the week before, it's crazy. So you have to use, uh, like I would definitely use different uh, word combinations and number combinations. Um, there are some limitations to this test. Um, number one uh, is that the balance part is part of the test. We assess their balance, but there actually is a practice effect on that, meaning that the more they do it, the better they get at their balance. There's another problem with it, which is the exact opposite. If they just had an ankle injury or have a history of an ankle injury and they're poor on that ankle, their balance may be off. And you know what? Some people are clumsy. So it's probably just better to get a baseline balance. Um, and so we're starting to do that now is to try to get a baseline balance assessment on athletes and then we have it. So if they have a concussion, we can go through this afterwards and see if anything's changed. But the biggest thing here is that it relies on the athlete's reporting of the symptoms. And that's something that we just haven't gotten away from. We don't have a blood test yet. We don't have a rapid test to tell us if we have a concussion. We actually may be heading there. And we can talk about that in the question and answer period if you want. But right now, everything's still based on what, whether the athlete tells us they have symptoms or not. Um, and the test is designed to diagnose a concussion, but not really manage a concussion. So it's really a test to help you decide if the athlete has a concussion. Even if they ace the test, if you still think that they have a concussion, we have a responsibility to pull that athlete off. Again, it's more of a clinical diagnosis. And the second point is that it's not really used to follow up them. After about seven days, it loses its uh, validity. So it's not really a great test. Two weeks afterwards, if they're still having symptoms, we don't give them the SCAT 2 again, or the SCAT 3. So um, other things that we can do in the office, when they come into the office now, not on the sidelines, I usually will go through their symptoms again, repeat the neurologic exam, do what's called a computerized neurocognitive exam where we kind of ha have them work on a computer and we, see, we with a special test that tests their ability to recognize patterns, uh, thought processing speed, things like that. Um, and sometimes I may need to use some consultants that I have at my disposal. So if they've had symptoms for a long time and they need medications, I might send them to neurology. If I think they need a formal neuropsychological evaluation because they're really having trouble remembering things, I'll send them there. If I think they need physical, not physical therapy, um, then they, I might send them to a PT. Uh, optometrists can be very helpful. There's very often vision problems and concussion uh, with something that we call accommodation, which is where you try to focus, which is actually why they have a lot of problems reading. And then psychology. There's a lot of mood issues that go on when you have concussions, especially if you have chronic symptoms. So why do we care so much about concussions in the first place? Well, it's because of the things that Dorothy kind of hinted at. Um, there can be some short-term problems and long-term problems. Short-term, uh, you can get something called second impact syndrome. Uh, I'm sorry, post-concussive syndrome. And post -con does anybody know who this is? Right. So post-concussive syndrome, this is Sidney Crosby. He's like the poster child of uh, post-concussive syndrome. Um, so the problem is there's really no uniform definition of what post-concussive syndrome is. Some people say it's symptoms that last for more than three months. Other people say it's symptoms that last for more than three to four weeks when you'd expect most concussions to resolve. They still have symptoms. They probably have post-concussive syndromes. Um, usually it's persistence of symptoms in a couple common realms like chronic headaches, chronic dizziness and balance problems, depression and anxiety, insomnia, or cognitive issues. Um, and how do we treat it? It's very difficult to treat. We actually try to get them back to exercise relatively quickly rather than rest. Um, sometimes we use medications, but these are really to treat the symptoms and to try to get them back to functioning. It's not really, as Dorothy kind of alluded to, the, the medications do not treat post-concussive syndrome. They don't allow you to heal faster. It's just a way to get you back to functioning better. Um, rehab is really kind of the key for right now, for what I think, and then uh, it, it requires a multidisciplinary approach. 
Um, and really, when I have people that come in with symptoms longer than a month or so, I look for other causes of their symptoms. Is it their neck? Do they have more cervical issues? Is it their eyes? Is it their balance system? Could they have just a post-traumatic headache or migraine? Um, could they have sleep problems? So many people have poor sleep, uh, sleep habits. Um, or could it be psychological? Second impact syndrome is something, I don't know if people have heard about this. This is where you get a concussion and you're recovering from the concussion. You get another hit to the head and that second hit can tip you over to having a significant swelling in the brain. And so um, it's thought that um, what happens is that brain is in a fragile state of healing after the first concussion. And if you keep playing or you go back too quickly and you get another hit to the head, it can actually cause swelling in the brain there's no place for the brain to swell inside of its locked box. It can only go down the hole where your spinal cord comes out. This is something that we call herniation, and it results in rapid death. So unfortunately, this syndrome can result in a morbidity. Almost 100% of the time, you're left with some residual neuro, neurologic issue. And it actually can kill in up to 50% of the people. Like literally, they can die on the field. So it's a very serious condition, luckily very rare, uh, probably about 100 cases reported in the literature. So thankfully it's very rare. However, one of the problems is that it's only seen in young people. Almost every single case was under the age of 22. So we think it has something to do with the brain, a developing brain, a brain maybe that's not finished myelinating, which is when the neurons get this fatty kind of sheath that's kind of protective on them. And so there may be some sensibility there um, when you're younger sensitivity. Um, what's the long-term risk of concussion? Well, actually, there was a study uh, by Kevin Guskowitz out of the, uh, Chapel Hill. He looked at almost 2,500 retired NFL players and asked them if they had trouble remembering things or had signs of depression. It turns out that if they had three or more concussions in their life uh, of playing football, they had a five times increased prevalence of mild cognitive impairment. Even if they had just one concussion, they had a three times increased incidence of memory issues. And three or more concussions, a three times increased prevalence of depression. And even with one concussion, they were over the one and a half times the rate of the general population. The NFL didn't really buy this, so they commissioned their own study uh, out of the University of Michigan. Unfortunately, their data was worse. Uh, they show that if you're a retired NFL player between the ages of 30 and 49, your rate of dementia was 19 times the general population. Um, and even at age 50 and a plus, it was six times the rate of the general population. And the risk of depression was 15, 16% incidence versus three to 4% in the general population. So there are definitely some long-term risks. And then CTE, I'm not gonna go over this in detail. This is what Dorothy was mentioning, but this is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is the note actually that Dave Dewerson left next to his body when he shot himself in the chest to save his brain for science. Um, his brain was donated to Boston University or Amici who Dorothy mentioned, Bob Cantu and others dissected it, stained it, and he had these tau proteins uh, staining there. So he actually had CTE. Um, and again, this is something that's very similar to Alzheimer's, but the average age of onset for Alzheimer's is 74. The average age for CTE is 54, 20 years younger in the prime of their lives. So. Um, all the 50 year olds in the room are going, really? That's the prime of my life? Wow. Um, how do we manage concussion? Uh, right now, the cornerstone of management is rest. So just like this baby, you just got to put your head down sometimes. So we talk about physical rest, and this means nothing. We make you a couch potato for a couple of uh, days or so. No sports, no weight training, no cardio, no gym, and definitely nothing that could injure your brain again. So don't get on a bike, don't get on a skateboard, anything like that. Now, there's a little asterisk after this slide because how much rest do you need? This is very controversial. In fact, the pendulum is swinging and we're starting to think we actually rest people a little too much. Do you need to be in a dark room with a, with a mask over your eyes? Uh, you know, no, really unlikely. I mean, there are cases where you might need that, but most people probably don't need that. So we do have to be a little careful that we might be shutting people down a little too much. And then we need cognitive rest. Um, and this may mean various things to various people. And I totally agree with what Dorothy said. This is an individualized thing. Every concussion is different. Even in the same athlete, 
Two concussions are not the same. And so it really depends where they are. If going to school bothers them, then they should not go to school. Um, so the, the thing is that you don't want to make their symptoms worse. In the initial kind of acute phase, we want to just allow the symptoms to get better on their own. So anything that you need to do to allow them not to have worsening symptoms. Um, and communication with the school is key, and the American Academy of Pediatrics in October of 2013 came out with what they call the Return to Learn Guidelines, and it actually is a really nice summary paper on how to get kids back to school, what are the things we should be looking for, it provides clinicians with a note that you could use, or parents to take to the school to say, hey, I don't think you should be in testing, things like that. Um, Kids, and when, you, when I already thought my teenage athletes hated me, then I tell them a couple other things. Listen, you really need to limit your screen time. You need to limit your time in front of these violent video games, in front of the TV, in front of the computer, texting. You need to avoid loud music. Um, the 17-year-old the who had the CTE that Dorothy put up, the slide, he went to a rock concert after a football game, after having a concussion, went out on a date, and came home the next day, didn't wake up. Parents went up to his room and found him hanging in his room. So who knows if the concert did something when he was already phonophobic and post-concussive. Um, but um, so, and obviously if they're having trouble with vision, trouble with balance, trouble with photophobia, they probably shouldn't be behind the wheel. Um, so, and that's how I, when I drive in in the morning, I can tell the people, so I'm like, concussion, 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 concussion. Then I just realized they're all just bad drivers in Chicago. So how much rest is too much rest? That's kind of the question. No medications. In the initial phase, we don't want to use medications for concussion. Now, on the flip side, I don't want people suffering. So um, I don't really want people suffering through a lot. So I mean, they can treat it, but I don't want them to do too much. Most concussions resolve, luckily, by seven to 10 days. Um, sometimes their symptoms go away, but they still have problems with cognition and memory, and that's a very important point. And that actually takes longer to clear the younger you are. Uh, so kids in, in college, this is what's up here, is that they took three days, kids in high school took seven days for their testing to go back to normal. So an athlete may think that they're symptom-free before they are. And when, we, when they don't have any more symptoms at rest, then we start them on what we call a graded return to play pro protocol, which is gradually increasing their exercise every day for over five days to make sure that they're okay to go back. They have to have a normal exam, they need to not be on medications, and if they did take uh, neuropsychologic testing, they need to be back to their baseline. And this just here is a slide to give you a quick idea of what we might do. Like, for step two, we might do walking or swimming or a stationary bike. Step three would be um, maybe skating drills in hockey or running drills in soccer. Uh, step four then would be uh, passing drills in soccer, for example. Five would be a full contact and practice, and then on six would be the return to play. Everybody does this protocol, whether you're in professional soccer or not. And it takes five days to go through it. If you have symptoms at one step, you rest for 24 hours and then retry that step. So that's what I had, um, and I'm sure there'll be questions, so we'll turn it over to that. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So while you all think of your questions, I'm going to take the first one. <laughs> um, so... I'm interested, yes, I'm going to give you this microphone. <laughs> I'm interested in, in how um, biologically useful the term concussion is. So we, we, we see individuals who um, have had no known concussions end up having CTE, end up being dead, and studied by the Boston group. And, and I'm so it's not it's not convincing. I've never been convinced that when there's a hit to the head that there might be something going on, some underlying pathology that shows no initial symptom but sets you on sets a person on a course that is is not going to be such a great course for them. And and I and I worry that the the concussion threshold gives people this confidence that if they don't get diagnosed with a concussion, they're good to go. Um, 
so I'm just I I I find it a a not a great not not a superbly useful term and certainly not one um, that I think does a service to the public because I think that they it 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 allows them to shade towards more um, more head injury. Um, is one that is actually starting to stick more than it used to. I mean, people used to just say that you were dinged, you just got bonked in the head, you'll be fine. Um, and so I think the diagnostic term concussion is beginning to, to mean a little bit more. Um, however, what you say is right. I mean, just being hit in the head without actually being officially diagnosed with a concussion still doesn't mean you're okay. you've gotten a hit to, to the head, you might have a headache for a couple hours, but then you're okay. Is that, is that bad? Is that just the fact that you just had that? And there is some data to suggest that perhaps those may not be so hot for him. Um, but that we're still really in, in infancy with the term. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, it's, uh, you know, more of the focus right now is actually on these subconcussive blows. Um, which are a blow to the head that could be causing some injury at some level, but we just don't know. It doesn't present with any symptoms. So, um, you know, in most of the cases of CTE that have been diagnosed, uh, we're looking at people who, for the vast majority, were boxers, uh, hockey, professional hockey players, or professional football players, which means that at age 50 when it presents, right, roughly, let's just say age 50, um, they have played middle school football, high school football, uh, college football, professional football. Does anyone know, they've actually done studies where they put sensors in helmets. Um, and they have to set a minimum, so usually it's set around like 20 Gs of force. Um, and part of the problem is the sensors, at, at this point, it's been tricky to pick up the rotational. So we're just measuring linear, uh, linear forces here. Um, does anybody have an idea what the average number of hits to the head a football player in high school takes in one season? That's over, that are over 20 Gs of force. So the average number of hits to the, to the helmet. So about 1,400, and in college, college football, 2,200. 2,200 hits to the head over 20 Gs of force. That's a problem. That's what we don't know, like, is that doing something? Is that shaking? Is that rattling your neurons every time you get hit to the head? This fragile, fragile organ, I'm pretty sure Mother Nature never intended us to be ramming other people with our heads. Um, so anyway, that, that's part of the problem. So totally agree with your point. Um, and, and the only other point that I would make along with that is, because um, I, I see this all the time, uh, you know, how many concussions have you had? Oh, two. Okay, well, how many times have you played a sport, gotten hit in the head, and had dizziness, headache, pressure in the head? Oh, I don't know, like nine, ten? I don't know. I can't even count. But I wasn't diagnosed with a concussion. Yeah, well, number one, our diagnosis uh, testing as we just, as I just went through is not great. It's actually all based on what you tell me, pretty much. Uh, and so any hit to the head where you have symptoms, to me, is a concussion. So you don't have to be diagnosed to actually have one, right? So. How helpful are MRIs with your testing? That's a great question. Uh, and I should have mentioned that. Um, so listen, as far as currently, an MRI and a CT scan are gonna be normal in a concussion. So um, there is, at, at this point in time, we're talking about a gross structural problem. That's what we use an MRI or a CT scan for. And so we use them. Sometimes you'll, you'll hear of kids that have gone to the ER to get, um, you know, and they get a CT or they get an, you know, usually you don't get an MRI in the ER. But what we're looking for there are brain bleeds, skull fractures, something else going on that would explain the symptoms. Um, but in a concussion, by definition, an MRI and a CT scan are normal. 
Um, there are two points that I want to make. Mo one is that um, now coming down the pipeline are actually newer tests that may be a lot m better than MRIs. Functional MRIs, something called diffusion tensor imaging, um, PET scans, there's these new type of scans where we may be able to pick up uh, change, and they've actually demonstrated changes in a brain after one acute concussion and that, that resolve as the concussion symptoms resolve. So very, very helpful information. The problem, these tests are extremely expensive. They're only in research institutions right now. So someday, maybe, that may be uh, down, the, down the line for us. Um, and then the only other point I wanted to make is that um, there's a risk to getting CT scans, right? So I have a kid right now who has had three head CTs in the last three weeks because the mom is convinced that he keeps hitting his head and she takes him to the ER. The ER's job is to rule out a bad problem. So the kid has gotten, he's 12, he's gotten three CT scans in the last three weeks. That is a huge amount of radiation on a developing brain. And actually there was a study in Lancet a year and a half ago that showed that kids that have had three or more head CTs have three times the risk of gliomas and brain tumors. So there is a huge, problem here. The answer is not to go to the ER and get a CT every time your kid hits the head, your head, you know? I had a mom once who's 12 year old. She said, I don't bring him to the ER anymore. I know they're just going to get a CT scan. And she's so worried about the, about the radiation, but she sent him back in every time to play hockey. But promising, really but it promising, but there are some promising leads, yeah. Typically, Alzheimer's is more focused on memory processes, well, whereas CT individuals also have sort of this aggressiveness, this emotionality that you do see in Alzheimer's patients, but it's usually a little bit more towards the end stage of Alzheimer's and usually presents earlier on as more memory-based, whereas CT is a little bit more cognitively-based, poor decision-making, erratic behavior, um, including emotionality. There are also neuropathological differences once you see the brain. That's a great question. I, I mean, not that I know of. I mean, the part of the scary thing is the group in Boston, Bob Cantu and, and his colleagues that are doing this have found CTE in a 17-year-old, like she mentioned, uh, a 19-year-old rugby player. So apparently the amount of cumulative trauma does not have to be that great if they're already getting some signs at 17. The, the current thinking is there's probably two subgroups of people with CTE. Um, I sit on a board with Bob so I get a little bit of insider information, but uh, there is a, there's a, the newest thing is there may be kind of two subsets of people that might get CTA and how they might develop uh, and the symptoms might develop over time. Um, and a big thinking is that you probably have to have some type of genetic predisposition to get CTE. So not everyone who plays football or hockey is gonna get CTE. But if you have this genetic predisposition and then you unfortunately choose to play football your whole life, you might be asking for trouble. But you know, these are things that more studies are needed.
as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, one of the things uh, that I'm passionate about is, is educating youth. You know, as, as Jeff said, if they come to the clinic and what's wrong with you, oh, nothing, I'm fine, but I have this headache and I have this dizziness. And, and so one of the things that I think is important is educating youth athletes. And when I do this, there's also adults in the room and parents and, and such. Uh, I think that's super important so that kids know that it's not okay after you hit your head to see double, that there's something wrong and that it's okay to report that. And it's okay to say something about it. Um, so I think youth education is important. I think uh, education of coaches and change in the culture of, uh, of sports in both high school and college is something that is slowly being, being changed. And really uh, events like this where, where we go out and, and, and teach the public a little bit about what we know And for that, for that case that you mentioned, you know, I think the pediatrician, the child's pediatrician, is a good source of information. The, um, we know a lot more about concussion in the last 10 years than we knew 10 years ago. We'll know a lot more in 10 more years. Um, but the good news is it is also an entity that um, primary care physicians are really getting a lot more education on now. And so hopefully the child's pediatrician or family physician is also a good source for that. But I'm not that worried about a three-year-old playing soccer. If you've ever watched three or four-year-olds play soccer, they just actually sit down and usually play with the butterflies and pick up the, <laughs> play with the clovers. There's probably not a whole lot of contact going on. Well, you mentioned goals. Uh, it seems like sports needs to be listed as one of their goals. So what are you doing? That's true. And actually, where it really becomes of an issue is what do you do with an eight-year-old or 10-year-old? You know, is it okay for an eight-year-old to head the ball? Is it, is it okay for you to be 13 and play contact lacrosse? Is it okay for you to play, be 12 and play tackle football? I mean, those are the, those are the hard questions and that's not that I'm gonna let Dorothy answer. Well, no. <laughs> it's a culture change, right? The American culture is extremely rooted in athletics. Um, coaches make more money than teachers. Um, you know, going to change that in terms of culture? No, but, um, but that is, I think, something that, you know, we need a sociologist in the room to, to help us figure that out. Lisa. Were you at Aspen? Who'd you see? <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. Um, the, um, no, it's th seeing stars, I mean, so uh, yeah, I think I put it up there as something like visual disturbances or something. And it can be anything from seeing stars to a lot of people report a flash of light, like a flash of orange or a flash of green or something like that. Um, it can be anything. But on the other hand, you know, not every time you hit your head, it's a concussion. And I feel like that's something that I also have to, like the iPad story I was telling you, which is actually real, um, I do get that a lot. And, you know, I mean, there's some times where you hit your head and you might see stars for a second, and then you give yourself a, a minute, and then you feel fine, and you don't have any headache, and you don't have any dizziness, and you don't have anything, and not every time that even I think you see stars for a second doesn't mean that you've suffered a concussion. So it really kind of depends what happens next, what happens after that minute, what happened, you know, if you continue to have symptoms and you start developing a headache and pressure in your head and fogginess and things like, yeah, okay, then I think you have a concussion, but. undergo a metabolic dysfunction 
physically, mechanically broken, they can rejuvenate, not rejuvenate, they, they can come back to normal and, and function properly. There are cases where there's an actual physical disconnection between part A and part B in your brain, and our adult brain doesn't like to regenerate too well, so it's not like new connections can be made at the drop of a hat. Um, that takes much, much more time. And there are, we've been focusing more on concussions per se, but there are multiple grades of traumatic brain injury. Um, you know, moderate, moderate to severe, and, and individuals in the TBI field argue about what that means and what those definitions mean. But, but there are obviously many types of traumatic brain injury where the individuals are left with long-term deficits and never, never yeah, I mean, there are billions of neurons, which is good. So in the concussion, even if you injure a small portion, the brain does have an ability to create kind of circuits around an injured area, and you can recover most of your function, maybe not everything, but, um, but it also depends on how much of the brain is affected, and that's where you get the gradations of traumatic brain injury. So it can be a little tricky. And for the most part, we're calling concussion mild traumatic brain injury, which is over way at this end of the spectrum. But it's such a terrible term because, I mean, for a lot of, I have a kid right now who has a concussion that's been four weeks and the kid's still horrible. Um, hor like hasn't been to school or anything. Uh, so it's, that's not mild. So it, it can be really challenging. Yeah. Uh, I really Yes, so yeah, it's a, it's a good point. And you know, the 85% was actually from a study about 10 years ago, a newer study came out, um, which is closer to 40%. Um, but it's still a huge chunk of people that are not being forthright about the symptoms that they're having. Um, I definitely think we have gotten, you know, a lot of people ask me all the time, uh, you know, are we in a concussion crisis? Are we actually seeing more? Um, well, I don't know. I don't know. It's a little common. It's a little bit of both, I think. I think we are seeing more because if you look at the average size of the NFL player today and you compare them to the mid 80s, I have a slide. I just didn't, there was too much information to put up today, but every single position is, weighs more today. And uh, if you look at the average size, I mean, I just go and cover, you know, high school and college. I can't even see over the sidelines. I mean, these kids are huge now. You know, and uh, so I think we have more mass, more speed, which means more force, right? It's physics. So um, you're going to have harder hits. And so I think we are seeing more concussions for reasons like that. But I also think uh, to hit uh, your point, I think we've gotten a lot better at diagnosing them. So um, the documentation is key, documenting exactly what symptoms they have, following that over time. And for example, for the fire, if we have a concussion at the Chicago fire, every day they come into the training room and we document what symptoms they have today and we follow this out progressively and we see are the symptoms getting better, are they getting better in some areas but not in other areas, I mean, and we're doing this for colleges too. So the documentation of the symptoms is key. Yeah, so you don't have to have everything on that list um, to have a concussion, but it does get tricky because some people have headaches, 
going in, right? Some people get daily headaches, and then so uh, you know, even something like the headaches have become worse; they're more pervasive, things like that. That could be concussion. It, it's it's very difficult because there's there's no magic wand test, so we have to base it on the symptoms. And so for me, in a case like that where they don't have all the classic symptoms, but they might have just a couple, the real issue is: did it start with this hit? If it started with this hit, then I think it's likely a concussion or a brain injury. Um, and if it didn't, then it didn't. But I wish I had a magic test to find out. And it looks like we're out of time. So, sure, go ahead. Um, so it sounds like he was asking, you know, when kids come in for uh, pre-participation physical and they want to do a sport that's kind of considered high risk, what do I tell them? Do I tell them they should choose a different sport or something like that? So, did you want to? I'll give my perspective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it, it's it's difficult. You know, the, the hardest question for me to answer is would I let my kid play football? Um, you know, I have two daughters. They could play football, right? There are women. We had a girl at Oak Park High School uh, just a couple years ago who played football. Um, and certainly, it's not like women's soccer is a whole heck of a lot better. In fact, there was a study about 10 years ago that showed that women's soccer was the highest risk sport. I didn't put that one up there because there's just actually too many studies to cite. And there was a recent study that actually showed that, again, women's soccer is probably one of the highest risk sports, uh, if not the high, absolute highest risk sport for girls and women. So um, whether you're a boy or a girl and you come in and it's, you know, I, I, but I will tell you, I think that the positive benefits of playing sports outweigh the risks at this point. Um, I think that we just need to become better as society and better as individuals about protecting our kids. And if it comes down to no tackle football below 14, then it might have to be no tackle football be below 14. Do, can we definitely make practices better? Yes. They don't need to hit every day of the week, right? They don't even need to hit one day of the week, I mean, to be honest. I mean, you, there's so much that you can learn to play football that does not involve hitting your head every single practice. Um, a proper helmet, yes, is key, but it's also not um, a panacea that's gonna protect you from every head injury. And, and you know, the, the bigger problem that I see too a lot of times is the parents, well, do I spend the $600 to get the Revolution X257344 23B? It's, you know, or do I spend the $100 and get this helmet, but it had the it didn't have the five-star rating? Um, you know, that's a, that, there's a whole, that's a whole nother elect the topic of conversation, you know? Um, but I, I kind of think we just need to be smarter about it as a society. We might, we, we're gonna have, to, I don't think the game's gonna go away, but I think the game is gonna have to change. It's already changed, and it's gonna have to continue to change to make it safer. Um, so that's, that's what my kind of take is, is that we need to make the sports safer. We don't need to eliminate them. I still clear kids every season to play football. Um, but now, if they've had a history of five concussions playing football, I might say, hey, golf's not so bad. You get to swing a stick at something and, you know. Um, but I also think individually we need to become better. And this kind of goes back to this woman's um, point, which was just, you know, when they come in or when they go in to see the pediatrician, when they ask somebody else for their advice, you know, um, the biggest thing for me is, listen, you can't ignore these hits to the head. If you get a hit and you get symptoms, what, like what Dorothy was saying, you have to advocate for yourself. You have to pull yourself out. No one can feel what you're feeling. If you get hit and you're feeling fogginess, you're feeling pressure in your head, you have to stick up for yourself and you say, you know what, this is my brain. I only have one brain. Like, I need to pull myself out and give it a minute and see what I, how things progress. Now, teaching a 14-year-old to do that is, if not impossible next to impossible. But I think that by educating and doing these kind of talks and things like that, that's the best way to go.
Yeah. Yeah, you know, heading the ball in soccer is interesting. The jury is kind of still out. We don't know how bad it is for you. Um, uh, I'll give you, I'll play devil's advocate. I'll give you the two sides of the coin. One is that, anybody in this room play soccer? Growing up, ever play soccer? When you go to head the ball uh, and you see the ball coming at you, you tighten up your neck, you actually lean back, and then you lean into it with your whole body, basically starting at your legs. So it's not just your head going back and forth like a bobblehead. It's really your whole body's leaning into it, and you're trying to hit it right off the, actually, the thickest part of your skull, if you do it right. So in and of itself, heading the ball may not be as bad, I mean, if you're doing it correctly. Most concussions in soccer happen from heading the ball, but not the actual heading of the ball, but you going for the ball and colliding, or you're going and somebody's coming from behind, and so basically striking your head with another player or against the ground. Um, now, there have definitely been lots of cases where you're not expecting the ball, and the ball's coming this way, and you're looking this way, and then it basically causes that type of a whiplash-type injury. So, um, however, there was a study in women's, so I mean, there's always one study that refutes another study, which is why we have we have no idea what we're saying up here. Uh, but, um, but there was one study that was actually fairly recent where they actually asked um, girls in high school and they counted the number of times they headed the ball and they asked them their concussion symptoms and looked at their grades. And this is actually a very recent study. It was just published. Um, and they actually found that there was a correlation between more heading of the ball, worse grades, and more symptoms down the line. So. We, we don't know. Um, now, there is a movement nationally, though. So there's a movement nationally to look at this. And I think there's a lot of studies happening right now looking at heading the ball in soccer. Well, that's the, uh, that's the bigger question is, is there an age that we should, and I'm actually a big proponent of this, I, because I just don't think that when you're 10, you have the next strength to do what I just said you should do to head the ball. I just don't think you have it. And I think you need to, yeah, you, I think you should wait almost basically, and my kind of thought is almost till high school to before you start heading the ball. But, um, but yeah, there is kind of a movement to look at this. data about the energy crisis and, and such, that's actually some classic data. It's, it's going almost on 20, 20 years old now. Um, in, in terms of where is it going, it's been documented that this energy crisis happens in an animal study. You know it's about two weeks. Um, it's harder to translate that into the human because, as, as Jeff mentioned, there's, it's harder to image an energy crisis in the living human brain. Um, most technology for that is more research-based. Um, although it has been documented that this energy crisis does occur in the human, but in terms of the length of resolution of that energy crisis, it's extremely variable from an individual to individual. A lot of this work was done at UCLA. Um, your second question regarding sex differences. There are definitely sex differences in, with regard to how uh, women uh, absorb impact from concussion. Uh, women's necks are more slender, we don't have, you know, we don't have the big, thick, defensive linemen's necks um, to support our heads. Um, so that being said, from a physics standpoint, women are more prone to concussions just because of how we're built. Um, however, we do have a fantastic little hormone called estrogen that has been demonstrated to be neuroprotective. Um, and, and so it, it's, so there's, there's a little bit of both, right? Women are more prone to the physics of head injury, but we have some endogenous hormones that can help us potentially recover from it. Um, that being said, in terms of research, there is a paucity of, of research just on gender differences in health in general. And I know that this is something that the NIH, National Institute of Health, is working more on, is, is trying to look at gender differences um, it, with regards to what I can tell you from what has been published is that, yes, there are sex differences um, with regards to how recovery processes or the diagnostic processes, there's not
not enough substantial data on this. Right. Yeah, if you wanted to look it up, GISA, G-I-Z-A, Christopher GISA out of uh, California, LA, is like one of the top researchers for the metabolic crisis. He's got a lot of papers out there. Um, so he's a good resource if you Google him, I'm sure you can find 20,000 citations from him. I have a little more questions. Uh, in terms of the use of course, and the mineral and the basic for antibiotics, how important is it to be kind of letter trainers and all, you know, to be higher people at the university of practice than all the people in the street who are going to have a full time job? How does it play into what you mean by kind of using making them better? So it's getting strokes of cat that they can't be administered without an athletic trainer. So how do we go about this in terms of making them better? I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's, you know, so I think the athletic trainer's role is absolutely key. Um, so for the schools that I cover, the teams that I cover, the athletic trainer is the triage person, the first line, the first, you know, they're the ones that they see first. But you hit the nail on the head, which is that we look even in Chicago, Chicago public schools, the vast majority of our schools, they do not have an athletic trainer. So... Right, 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 right. So, so you need to, so it, it's a, it, the athletic trainer is an integral part of the puzzle, but cannot be the only part of the puzzle. That's why a lot of these slice education um, seminars that we do, we deliver to parents, we deliver to coaches, we deliver to athletic directors because not every school has, not every athlete in, in Chicago and the United States has access to an athletic trainer. Yeah. Parents have to be their own advocates, and more so the parents. I've seen too many parents push their kids back in after they, you know, tough enough to get back mm -hmm. in. Parents have to be your own child's best advocate, yeah. and realize that if you are concerned and you've seen your kid get hit, there's no reason to put the child back in. Yeah. Okay. Um, one final question, and then we're gonna. Uh, Um, does do con do multiple concussions leave a mark that can be seen by X-ray? Could you follow this clinically with X-rays? Uh, no, I mean the the for an X-ray basically shows calcification, uh, so calcium uh, deposition like in your bones, or you could have calcium deposition in muscle or something like that. But uh, in a concussion, even though there's calcium <laughs> influx into the cell. Um, that eventually that energy crisis um, recovers. And uh, so in most cases, you activate these pumps, it pumps the, the, the uh, calcium out, uh, potassium back in, and that balance is kind of restored. So there's not like an accumulation of calcium that you could see later on an x-ray. Um,
Yeah, I mean, I don't really know the ins and outs of that particular case or anything in that uh, patient's past medical history. I mean, certainly many of these things, unfortunately, can be multifactorial, which is another problem, which is, you know, that we, that are, that is difficult. Um, but I, I do get that type of a question a lot, though, where I have patients come in and I'll, I'll even have young patients come in and they tell me they want to know if they have CTE because they've had three three concussions or four concussions and they're starting to forget where they put their keys and things like that. And I mean, at this, I tell them, you know, at this point, the only test I can run is an autopsy and I'm not really ready to run that test on you today. So, uh, you know, usually we just have to hold off on that one. Um, there may be more imaging that's coming down the line. So I don't know if, you know, how long it's gonna take for this case of yours to play out, but there are some institutions that are looking at things like the functional MRIs and diffusion tensor imaging and the things that we mentioned before that are really more investigational, um, but could be used perhaps in a case such as this to see if there is long-term damage that happened from multiple hits. It's hard to know. People, people have lots of psychiatric issues and substance abuse and all sorts of things that could also explain similar symptoms, so it's, it's difficult. I know Mayo has a study team that's doing that now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, and please join us outside. <laughs>